All right. Um, yeah. Welcome everyone again. Uh, this is our, our penultimate grand rounds of the calendar year. And uh, today we are joined by Dr. Philippe Pibaro. And um, we have the second of two back-to-back -back talks on, on aortic stenosis um, to complement uh, Dr. Sammy Elmeria's uh, talk from last week, which I hope we can pick up on some of the lively discussion and questions at the end of Dr. Pibaro's talk. Um, and then I would like to remind everyone that we will end with a special hybrid grand rounds with Dr. Michelle Albert um, next week. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, uh, we'll be at the nursing building N217 and the uh, food will be there for the grand rounds as well. So um, I hope there will be plenty of incentive to, to come to the nursing building um, to listen to uh, Michelle's great talk. Um, but <clears throat> without further ado uh, to today's talk, we again have Dr. Philippe Pibaro presenting on new frontiers in the diagnosis and management of aortic stenosis. And um, Philippe is a professor at the Department of Medicine of Laval University and holds the Canada Research Chair in Valvular Heart Disease at the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute. The objective of his research program is to develop and validate novel approaches to improve the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of valvular heart disease. He is currently the principal investigator of three multi-center studies funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Quebec. He has published more than 300 articles and uh, presented nearly at the same uh, 290 plus invited conferences in the course of his career. He is associate editor for the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography. He received the annual achievement award of the Canadian Society of Echocardiography. Um, the Research Achievement Award from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and the Feigenbaum uh, Lecture Award from the American Society of Echocardiography. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Pibaro. Thank you so much, James. And um, I'm very happy and, and, um, and honored to present at your grand round. I have uh, many friends and people I admire a lot. Uh, at UCSF, uh, including uh, Francesca, Sami, and uh, and others, and I, I have to say that the work that uh, comes from your institution has been a, has been a source of inspiration for us too. So thank you for that. Um, uh, and and uh, so aortic stenosis is a is a hot topic. I think this is the hottest topic, you know, in, in cardiology, right? So at the present time, and so it's good to have two grand rounds dedicated to this uh, to this disease. And what I'm I will do with you today is cover some of the new frontiers uh, or, or perspective. Uh, and, and, and I think the things that I'm um, within this hot topic that I'm uh, most excited about. Um, and uh, so I do have, however, before getting started, some disclosure I, I want to mention. And um, especially we are the echo call lab for several of the major TAVR uh, trial in, in the field. So it's important to keep in mind. So as you know, in the guidelines, you have this, um, this progression stages that have been proposed uh, and um, with the stage A, and this is for all valve disease, but this is for the for the aortic stenosis in particular here. Uh, so you have first the patients who are at risk of AS. So this includes patients with bicuspid valve and aortic sclerosis. So they don't have yet the clinical disease. Then you have stage B. These are patients with mild moderate AS. So they have the some pressure gradient, but you know uh, it's still mild moderate stages. And at this stage, there is no indication, of course, for intervention. And the guidelines suggest that you follow the patient, right? Uh, then you come to the point where the patient develops hemodynamically severe aortic stenosis, but has no symptoms, no LV dysfunction. So this is uh, in the American guidelines, the stage C1. And this is a, um, a subset of patients that is uh, debated and uh, we don't know yet what to do exactly. Should we do an earlier intervention or watchful waiting slash clinical surveillance approach? And finally, there is the, um, uh, the cases where you have severe ES and symptoms or LV dysfunction, this vine has an EF less than 50%. And we know that for this patient, there is a class one indication for valve replacement. Okay, so first frontier I would like to discuss with you is this subset of patients with, you know, uh, who are asymptomatic, severe AS, and the dilemma 
should we do early AVR versus clinical surveillance? So uh, I will start with a case, uh, hoping that the video clip will play, uh, which uh, may not be the case for this one, but whatever. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward case of patients with CVAS reporting no symptoms, uh, confirmed by exercise testing, because this is one of the things you have to pay attention in this a priori asymptomatic patient based on the medical history. Um, are they really asymptomatic? So it's always good to do a exercise testing to confirm that they are truly asymptomatic. BNP ratio is two, so somewhat elevated for this patient. LVEF is preserved. You cannot see on the video clip, but uh, you can believe me, it is around 60%. Um, and, and the... Um, uh, the, oops, sorry, the um, uh, AS severity on echo, oh, now the video clip is playing, so you see. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, there is another video clip not showing up, but showing a, a severely uh, calcified valve. Um, and uh, the uh, hemodynamic severity, you have a big jet velocity of 5.1 meters per second. Three years ago, we were 4.8 meters per second. So this means a progression of 0.3 meters per second uh, during the past year. The mean gradient is 64 millimeters of mercury. Um, so definitely a, a severe AS, very severe AS with a valve area by continuity 0.65, index 0.35. Okay, so we have a, a severe AS in a true asymptomatic patient confirmed by exercise testing. Do you think we should do valve replacement now or wait for symptoms or LV dysfunction? If you look at the guidelines, this is the latest edition and the algorithm that you have. Uh, we are over there, so CVIS. Um, uh, and for this patient with asymptomatic severe, the only situation where you have class one indication for valve replacement is if you have LVF less than 50%. This patient is at 60%. So, or if you have an indication for another cardiac surgery, for example, a cabbage. This is not the case in this patient. Otherwise, there is no class one indication as of now in the guidelines. There is, however, some opening, you know, there are some um, uh, class 2A indication for SAVR if, um, if the patient has abnormal uh, blood response or has some reduced exercise capacity and exercise testing, which is not the case in this patient, or if there is very severe AS defined as a peak jet velocity more than five meters per second, which is the case of this patient, if you have a rapid disease progression, so how is defined rapid disease progression in the guidelines? It's a progression rate in, in Vmax of more than 0.3 meters per second per year. So the patient is just on the edge. Uh, and she also has low risk, uh, low surgical risk. So this patient that I just showed you could qualify, if you will, for a class 2 indication for a SAP. Another criteria that is mentioned in the guidelines is a markedly elevated BNP defined as a BNP ratio uh, versus normal value for uh, agent sex, more than three. She, she the, the patient I showed you is elevated as BNP ratio of two, but not meeting this guideline criteria. Okay, this is good. We have um, we have a, a look at, look at the valve essentially and and consider some risk marker. Uh, but uh, it is also important beyond the valve to look at the left ventricle, and it makes sense because this is the cardiac chamber that is just upstream. Uh, the aortic valve and that is feeling this uh, pressure overload, you know, in the first place. But when we look at the left ventricle, I think it is important to look beyond the LV ejection fraction. Um, because if you look at the guidelines, the only trigger for intervention, I mean, besides the uh, aortic valve hemodynamics and severity, uh, is the LVF. And with this cut point of 50%. And uh, if you look at the LVF only, you may consider in a patient with uh, without stenosis that you have a beautiful day in front of you with a calm and beautiful sea. But, but, but if you look at parameters that are more sensitive to subclinical LV dysfunction, that might be a different story. And indeed, if there are several studies, including this study from the Mayo Clinic, um, showing that probably this cut point, this trigger that we have in the guidelines of LVF less than 50% is, 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 uh, is too low it is lacking sensitivity to detect subclinical dysfunction. Uh, because I think it's important to keep in mind that the LVF grossly underestimate the extent, the presence and severity of LV dysfunction in patient with LV concentric hypertrophy, with LV concentric remodeling, which is generally the case in patient with AS. 
So uh, if you look at this um, these curves, uh, blue curve is the, the patient with LVF more than 60%. And for this patient, you have a, a good good outcome, good survival. Uh, red curve is less than 50%. This is a no-brainer. You have a, um, uh, a reduced mortality, uh, a reduced survival in the short term. But if you look at this stratum between 50 and 60, that generally we consider as normal, right, according to guidelines, um, well, you see that these patients have a uh, not a good outcome and actually uh, almost as bad, at least in the short term, as patients with LVF uh, less than 50%. And then in the longer term, they are in between, you know, um, uh, the 50 and more than 60, but definitely worse than the patient with an LVF uh, more than more than 60. So I think there is an important take home message here is that probably uh, the cut point that we have in guidelines is too low and that it, cut point around 60% would be more appropriate to, to identify LV systolic dysfunction in patients with AS and eventually trigger earlier intervention. And by the way, in the most recent edition of the guidelines, you have this new recommendation. If the LVF falls below 60% on three serial imaging studies, this is considered as a class, class 2B uh, indication for valve replacement. European guidelines, they use a somewhat different approach. They used a lower cut point, so 55% in between 50 and 60, but with a stronger indication of 2A. Um, so um, the other approach we can use to overcome this lack of sensitivity of the LVGFN fraction is to consider other parameters that are more sensitive, such as the global longitudinal strain that we can measure easily by speckle tracking. Um, and so in this meta-analysis, actually, you see that, um, well, about one third of patients with asymptomatic CVRS have reduced longitudinal uh, function defined as a GLS less than 14.7. Let's round it at 15%. Uh, and if they do, they have a reduced survival. And what is interesting is that even in the group of patients with LVF more than 60%, where you would say, oh, okay, I'm fine. You know, LVF more than 60%, it is about sure that there is no LV dysfunction. Well, again here, one third of patients have GLS less than 15% and they have increased mortality. So, uh, and the patient I mentioned before, what, what an LVF of 60%, the GLS is minus 13. So she would be identified as having, you know, uh, subclinical dysfunction uh, uh, based on the GLS. Okay, so we are making progress. We look at the left ventricle more carefully, uh, but uh, we have to remember that the heart has four chambers, right? And so we need to look at the other chambers. And uh, so this is where we, um, with uh, Philippe Genereux from Morristown, we uh, we did a brainstorming at, a, at some point and we said, well, probably we have to, to, to use the same approach as our colleague do in oncology. In oncology, the risk stratification and therapeutic decision making is always based on a two-fold uh, assessment. First, the grading of the uh, primary tumor, of course, so uh, and, but also the staging of the extension of the tumor. And so we should do the same in cardiology and in particular in AS. We should, of course, grade the severity of AS. And we spend a lot of time on this because the Indication for intervention are primarily based on the presence of a CVIS. But we have to keep in mind that uh, the aortic stenosis per se, uh, even if it is severe, this is not what is killing the patient or determining the outcomes. In the end, uh, what is determining the outcome is the consequences, the repercussion of the ES uh, and the ES severity on the cardiac chamber, on the structure and function of the cardiac chamber. So we need to somewhere in our assessment, stage the extent of extra valve cardiac damage. And so um, uh, we propose a, 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 a classification based on, um, on, uh, on several echo parameters and criteria that we use every day and that are already in the, uh, uh, in the recommendation that we use. Uh, and this is the paper that uh, we did with uh, Lionel Tasté when he was a PhD uh, student in my lab, and now he is uh, having a great time uh, at your institution doing a postdoc uh, with Francesca. 
And so um, uh, this was a multi-center study uh, uh, bringing together several heart valve clinics. And so these were patients with asymptomatic CVIS and absence of symptoms were confirmed by exercise testing in most patients. And so we use this simple um, staging. So stage one is um, a damage at the level of the left ventricle using this criteria. So criteria for LV hypertrophy, grade two or more diastolic dysfunction, EF less than 60%, not 50 because of what I showed, and also adding GLS, you know, to kind of improve the, the sensitivity of the criteria to identify stage one. And if you have one criteria, you qualify for stage one, okay? Um, um, stage two, we go upstream, left atrial mitral valve damage with enlarged left atrium, moderate severe MR, and or AFib. This is the only non-echo parameter included in this classification, but it is so important that we felt was important to uh, to include it. Then stage three, pulmonary arterial tract speed valve damage with systolic pulmonary hypertension and, and or moderate or severe TR. And finally, stage four, right ventricular damage with moderate or severe RV dysfunction based on TAPSER in particular. And uh, stroke volume index less than 30 ml per meter square, which is a marker for uh, moderate or severe low flow state. Low flow state, it is defined with a cut point of 35. 30 is more moderate, 25 is more severe. And we put it in stage four because the low flow may be caused by damage at any cardiac chamber, right? And so, and for us, it was a kind of a marker uh, of the early phase of cardiac decompensation and heart failure, although the patient is still asymptomatic. So, um, uh, the results were, were uh, quite striking, actually, uh, because we saw that, well, there were relatively few stage zero, you know, these are patients with, with CVIS, um, about 27% were stage one. The most prevalent was stage two, surprisingly, uh, although patients were asymptomatic, and stage three and four put together, not many, but still a 14%. So in these patients with true asymptomatic CVIS, 61% of them had advanced cardiac damage, so stage two, three, or four. And if they had stage two, three, or four, they had a, an impact on outcome. And not in three or four or five years, in the first year, you see increased risk in mortality within the first year of follow-up in these patients who have stage two, three, or four. Uh, so important take-home message here is that the absence of symptoms is falsely reassuring with regard to the absence of cardiac damage. Absence of symptoms does not mean that there is no cardiac damage. So if there are symptoms, of course, it's a, it's a no-brainer, class one indication for intervention. But if there are no symptom, I think it is first making sure that the patient is true asymptomatic. And second, look at the echo to uh, look for cardiac damage stage. And if stage two or more, that might be an argument, at least in the future, to consider earlier intervention. The other very interesting study that we, we did, um, and this was with Philippe Genereux, in the, we put together the partner two and three court, uh, and we put together the TAVR and SAVR arms, so about 2,000 patients, uh, because we wanted to see uh, what was the improvement in the cardiac damage stage following a successful AVR, TAVR or SAVR. And we're expecting that the majority of the patient would actually uh, improve um, their, their, their stage. Um, well, it was a bit of a cold shower, if you will. Uh, only 15.6% of the patient improved their stage from baseline to one year. Uh, most of them, 57.9% remain the same. And sadly, 26.5% uh, even worsened the stage. And if they had the worsening of their stage following AVR, this was associated with a 2.25 fold increase in subsequent mortality. Uh, so um, uh, this was maybe that the message that we intervened too late in the course of the disease. And once the cardiac damage stage, especially advanced cardiac damage stage is there, it is difficult to, uh, to have a regression, even if we do a perfect AVR. The other thing that was interesting is the predictors of worsening of cardiac damage stage. There was hypertension. I think, again, an important message here is that when we treat AS, 
we tend to focus on the valve and we tend to focus you know, on the procedure, the valve replacement, et cetera. And, and maybe we forget the comorbidities uh, and, and risk factors uh, that, that the, may pa the patient may have concomitantly. And so I think it is important to make sure that once you've done the valve replacement, to have an optimized management of the risk factors and comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, um, cardiac amyloidosis, et cetera. And the other predictor of worsening was uh, the, the fact of doing a surgical versus a transcatheter aortic valve replacement, essentially because surgical valve replacement was associated with a, a new onset of uh, right ventricular dysfunction, so stage four. Um, the, the, the right ventricle doesn't like the, uh, the open heart surgery, obviously. So this is to summarize how this cardiac damage staging may be useful in the management of AS. Um, uh, so you have this simple classification, multi-parameter integrative approach. Of course, that is a work in progress. Huh? With Philippe Genereux and, and, and Lionel, we, we propose some simple echo parameters and criteria. But eventually, this staging may be optimized and improved by addition of other parameters from other modalities, such as CMR, with eventually a percentage of extracellular volume, blood biomarkers such as BNP or A sensitivity troponin, et cetera. And so I think in these asymptomatic CVAS patients, um, I think, although it's not yet in the guidelines, but maybe one day we're gonna use you know, the stage and maybe the threshold of the stage two and beyond to trigger earlier intervention in these asymptomatic patients. And for those who are symptomatic, already having indication for AVR, the staging may be useful to select um, the type of AVR. And I think, you know, if you have already a damage of the right side unit, so stage three or four, uh, this might be an argument for selecting a TAVR versus a SAVR because clearly the SAVR is associated with deterioration or new onset of uh, right ventricular dysfunction. So uh, as you know, we have a trial or several trials, but this is maybe the largest one that is ongoing on this patient with asymptomatic CVAS confirmed to be uh, asymptomatic by a treadmill stress test, and they are randomized to transfemoral TAVR versus clinical surveillance. Recruitment uh, has been closed for, for some time now. And uh, we, well, it is planned to present the results uh, in 2024. We were aiming for ACC, not sure we're gonna make it, but um, this will be somewhere, in, uh, somewhere in, in, uh, in 2024. So a conclusion with regard to this first frontier, Okay, asymptomatic CVIS, the stage C1, according to the guidelines, no class one indication for AVR, unless, of course, LVF is less than 50%, uh, or indication for other cardiac surgery. Um, however, there are some uh, class 2A indication for AVR. If there is very CVIS, fast stenosis progression, elevated BNP, and low surgical risk, and you have this new indication, you know, with class 2B or 2A, depending on which side of the Atlantic guidelines you're using, um, uh, if LVF is less than 60% or 55%. And so uh, there are several uh, ongoing trials uh, that, uh, uh, that, that we are looking for, especially early TAVR. And maybe this cardiac damage staging, I think, can be useful in the practice to assess the extent of cardiac damage and maybe consider or, or optimize the timing for intervention and also the type of intervention once there is an indication for intervention. So the, the second frontier I would like to discuss with you is this issue of low flow, low gradient, which is always you know, a very challenging subset of patients. And, uh, and indeed, when you have a low flow, low gradient um, that is defined, I'm gonna try to go back to see if the, um, video clip will play. Um, and and uh, whatever, it's not mandatory. Um, so uh, in this patient, you have a discordant grading at echo. So meaning that you have a valve area less than one centimeter square that is consistent with CVIS, but a mean gradient that is low, so less than 40, consistent with non-CVIS. So uh, of course uh, you need to, to reconcile this discrepancy to guide the treatment and see if there is an indication or not for intervention. And there are actually three subgroups of, um, of uh, low flow, low gradient. You have on the left, the classical low flow, low gradient patient with reduced EF, low flow. That's in fact the H 
PEF form of, of, of ES and V2 stage in the American guidelines. And then you have those with preserved ES, uh, but nevertheless, a low flow state defined in the guidelines as a stroke volume index to body surface area less than 35 ml per meter square. And this is what we call the paradoxical low flow low gradient, the HPEF form of AS, D3 stage in the guidelines. And finally, you have another category that is not well addressed by the guidelines, I can tell you. It's what we call a normal flow low gradient AS. They have preserved EF, normal flow, but still the discordant gradient with a small valve variant and the low gradient. So um, this is a case of a uh, paradoxical uh, low flow low gradient uh, patients again the video clip are not playing but if I can mimic that uh, <laughs> this is a, a, a 80 year old patient with um, hypertension treated um, well controlled with ACE no evidence of CAD she's symptomatic uh, functional class 3 at some half hour hospitalization she has a, 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 um, a good ventricle you know uh, LVF is around 65 percent by pipeline Simpson and you can appreciate, although the video clip is not playing, but there is a pronounced concentric remodeling, a small LV cavity. We have a grade two diastolic dysfunction, some impaired feeling. The longitudinal strain is reducing this patient. So a kind of HPEF profile, right? Uh, this is the typical HPEF uh, type of, of ventricle and um, some dilated uh, left atrium. And uh, yes, severity on echo, the valve area is 0. 0.64, index 0. 0.36, Doppler velocity index is 0. 0.19. She has a mean gradient of 26. And a, so there is a discordance. You know, you have a clearly, if you look at valve area, Doppler velocity index, it's severe, but the mean gradient is moderate, right? And the explanation for the discrepancy may be the presence of a low flow state because indeed the stroke volume index is, is lower than 29 ml per meter square. And, and uh, you can also appreciate, uh, you know, on the, on the parasternal uh, long axis and short axis view of the, of the valve that it is calcified, thicken, and reduced opening that you cannot see, but um, it does not look a good valve, right? And, and so uh, the pathophysiology in this patient with AS, often concomitant hypertension, is that they have the pronounced concentric remodeling, the impaired feeling, the impaired longitudinal systolic function. So this contributes to reduce the forward stroke volume, although the LVF is, is, is normal and some and even sometimes supranormal. Um, and uh, plus the fact that they often have AFib, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, all contributing again to reduce the, the flow despite the preserved EF. And also up to 15% of these patients may have concomitant cardiac amyloidosis. Um, and so all these factors uh, contribute to a low flow despite the preserved EF. That's why we label this entity that was new at the time when we reported it in uh, 27, um, um, paradoxical low flow. And of course, if there is a low flow, you may have a low gradient despite the CVIS because the gradient is highly flow dependent. Uh, so you have the same challenge as in patient with classical low flow, you will have to confirm the stenosis severity. And what the guidelines now tell you for this patient is to use CT, non-contrast CT, measure the aortic valve calcium score to confirm the stenosis severity. Because indeed, in patient with, with paradoxical low flow, as well in those with normal flow low gradient, by the way, Dobutamine stress echo is not the optimal test because they already have a normal or supranormal LVF. They have a small LV cavity that will not respond well to dobutamine stress echo. So really the best approach to confirm the stenosis severity is calcium score by CT. And it's two indication according to guidelines to do a, a CT in this patient. And if you confirm that the stenosis is severe based on CT, um, the American guidelines in the recent edition, they, um, they give a class one indication for intervention in this patient. The open guidelines are still on 2A, but I mean, 2A or 1 is a strong indication. So you don't want to miss this patient. So if we come back to the patient I showed you with a paradoxical low flow, low gradient, we did the calcium score. 2,600 is, is, is very high for women uh, because indeed, um, uh, as you know, in the guidelines, the cut point that are recommended to uh, confirm CVIS are more than 2,000 in men, but uh, more than 1,200 in women. So 2,600 for women is 
twofold higher versus the uh, cut point for severe. So kind of very severe. So she underwent TAVR and did well. Um, so um, um, I'm trying to advance the new slide. Yeah, uh, one thing about cardiac amyloidosis I want to uh, mention first is that, uh, especially in this patient with, with a low flow low gradient and those with paradoxical low flow preserved DF, you may have up to 15% of patients who may have a concomitant ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, if you have some red flags at echo, ECG or clinical red flags, don't hesitate to, to do a, a bone scintigraphy and a light chain analysis to confirm the presence of, of, um, uh, of AS. And, and I mean, the presence of cardiac amyloidosis does not preclude the consideration for valve replacement because you still have to treat the aortic stenosis. But on the other end, if there is cardiac amyloidosis, as you know, we have now pharmacotherapy to eventually uh, retard um, the uh, the deposit of, of, of the amyloid substance. The other thing that we have to be careful with these patients uh, is that there is some recent evidence that the amyloid may infiltrate not only the myocardium, but also the valve. And so it may eventually lead maybe a cause of the aortic stenosis. And in such case, um, the valve may not be that calcified. And so there are some reports of false negative cases on CT in patients with low flow low grade AS and, and cardiac amyloidosis because they have severe AS, true severe AS, but they don't, uh, they don't meet, if you will, the cutoff for a severe aortic valve calcium scored CT because the valve is thickened and stiffened, not only, not, not, only and, 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 and sometimes not at all because of the calcification, but more because of the infiltration of uh, amyloid substance. So that might be something to, to consider. So we have a solution for that. Um, um, uh, that is, a uh, instead of using non-contrast CT uh, with a group uh, uh, of Mark Dweck in Edinburgh, we, we have used a contrast CT, so CT angio, to assess the fibrocalcific burden. And, um, uh, and so you, because the non-contrastity the non only see the calcification, not the uh, non-calcific or non-mineralized tissue such, such as the dense fibrotic tissue or the amyloid substance. And, and this is very, uh, very interesting here to see that uh, if you focus on the two uh, panels that are uh, at the bottom, um, you see that these two patients, the uh, panel E and F, they, they have the same volume of fibrocalcific tissue overall, and they have the same hemodynamic severity. They are both patients with severe AS, but not for the same reason. Uh, the, the patient on panel E is a man with a lot of calcification and um, a, a not, not a big amount of, of tense fibrotic tissue. So essentially here, the stenosis is mainly driven by the calcification, whereas the panel F is a woman and women typically have less calcification, but more fibrosis than men. And you see in this woman, there is almost no calcification and the stenosis is essentially driven by uh, the uh, fibrotic remodeling of the valve only. So that might be uh, a, a, an imaging modality that we, we will uh, want to use in the future. So the outcome of this patient with low flow low gradient um, following uh, AVR, this is the uh, results of the partner two trial and registry analysis that we did. And you see that, well, if we look at the different flow gradient pattern, paradoxical low flow, normal flow low gradient, they have an outcome following AVR that is as good as the high gradient, let's say traditional form of, of AS. The only group that is uh, shows some somewhat higher mortality, not surprisingly, this is the classical low flow low gradient with the low EF. And this is a, um, so this is not randomized. This is from our Topaz registry, which is an internal, international registry of low flow low gradient. Um, you see that um, we compare different uh, type of treatment, but again, it's not randomized. It's propensity score uh, matched. Uh, but the the best outcome were with the, the least invasive approach to transfemoral tiber 
followed by cyber, followed by alternative access cyber, and clearly conservative management was associated with poor outcomes in these patients. So if we summarize for this second frontier, um, well, the first thing when you have a low gradient AS uh, with discordant grading is to confirm the accuracy of the measurements. That's very important, you know, especially the LVOT diameter. For those of you who are echo, echo people or imaging people, you know how challenging it could be. And then determine the flow status. Is it a classical low flow low gradient? If such is the case, what is recommended is a low dose of vitamin stress echo to, to do the tie break, uh, true severe versus pseudo severe. Um, if it's paradoxical low flow or normal flow gradient, so low gradient AS with preserve DF, the best way to go is CT calcium score using different cut point in men and women. And, um, and also calcium score may be used in patients with um, uh, dobutamin stress echo that is inconclusive, that is non-diagnostic. And if you confirm CVAS now in low gradient AS, well, it's a class one indication for intervention. Um, and finally, I think in this low flow, low gradient AS patient, there might be an advantage of doing a transfemoral tower rather than a SAR. So the, 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 the third new frontier is um, another, I think, very hot topic uh, because now we are not looking at uh, uh, severe AS, but now we're looking at moderate AS, at risk moderate AS, and same debate. In moderate AS, well, at risk, should we consider AVR? Uh, although the stenosis is still moderate and not yet severe. So if you look in the guidelines, there is no indication for intervention in moderate AS. The only, uh, let's say, potential indication is if you have a moderate AS and the patient has another indication for um, cardiac surgery or cabbage or mitral valve intervention, then you may consider SABR, but it's a 2B indication, so it's not very strong. Um, uh, so, um, again, as for each frontier I would like to discuss with you, I have a case, and this is a, um, a case of a uh, moderate AS with a very poor LV ejection fraction, uh, um, uh, LVF of 20%, and at rest, there was a discordant grading with a valve area of 0.85 severe with a mean grading of 22, so um, this was a patient with low EF, so we did what the guidelines recommend. We did the dobutamine stress echo. We got a good uh, flow response, good uh, contractile reserve, and the gradient increased from 22 to 32, but remained below 40 at the end of dobutamine stress echo, so still moderate. And the valve area that was severe at rest is now moderate. So the dobutamine stress echo has reconciled the valve area and the gradient and is now telling you this is not severe AS. This is moderate AS, or what we call pseudo severe, but moderate. And now the next question is okay, wait a minute. Okay, so there is no indication for intervention, but is this moderate AS with this mean gradient of 22 or 32 at uh, on stress really benign for this poor ventricle uh, uh, with an LDF of 20%? Um, well, first, let's look at the data of patients with moderate AS, and this is whole commerce, not only a patient with reduced CF first. It's, uh, you know, and this is from the NIDA registry, this nationwide echo registry from Australia. Huge number of patients, you see more than um, 2,000 patients. And um, these are the, 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 the survival curves for uh, no ES. Uh, so um, uh, no ES is, is actually uh, in, in red then you have mild in green, then you have moderate in purple, and then you have severe in black. And what is striking is that you see for any degree of AS, you have a, um, a, a mortality penalty. You know, you have an excess mortality and you can see it quite clearly already mild versus no AS, big step, you know, big increase in, 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 uh, in, in mortality. Um, and what is also very striking to me is that of course, as expected, with moderate AS, you have, you know, uh, again, a, uh, a big step in the reduction in survival. Uh, but what is the most striking in this graph is that moderate AS is almost as bad as, uh, as severe AS. Uh, and so uh, you may say, oh, yeah, but this is maybe because moderate AS is progressing rapidly to severe AS. For sure, in some patients, that's probably the case. But you see that the, the moderate AS curve 
start to separate from the mild and stick with the severe, uh, even in the short term, even in the first one or two years. So it's not only a question of progression. Uh, I think the message here is that moderate AS is not benign. And, and now if you transpose this to uh, what if we look at moderate AS according to LVF, well, this is even worse. Uh, the worst case scenario, this is a, a meta-analysis of reconstructed time to event data that we did with Michel Pompeusa, and uh, it's not published yet, so I'm showing that for the first time, but um, you see that uh, the worst case scenario, clearly, uh, if you have moderate AS, well, you have a uh, worse outcome, reduced survival versus no mild AS. Okay, fine. But if you have moderate AS and reduced LV ejection fraction, this is the worst case scenario. So the combination of moderate AS and systolic heart failure appears to be a, a deadly uh, combination. And this is what is supported also by the study that we did. It was a tri-center study. It's retrospective, it's propensity score match, so is uh, some, some limitation definitely. But uh, what we did, we, we matched patient with moderate AS and systolic heart failure with patient with systolic heart failure, but no AS, okay? And we match for uh, age, sex, and LVF. And you see that patient with moderate AS who did not uh, undergo AVR during follow-up, this is the blue curve. They have a very poor outcome. 88% are dead by six years. Um, if you have moderate AS, but they underwent valve replacement somewhere during the follow-up, uh, this is the red curve, well, the mortality is somewhat higher versus the uh, systolic heart failure with no AS, but close. You know, there is a difference, but uh, this is not as bad as the patient who did not um, undergo valve replacement. So I think it, it, what it tells you is what is moderate AS for a good ventricle may actually be equivalent to severe for a depressed ventricle. It's always a question of balance between the magnitude of the pressure overload imposed by the severe or the moderate AS, or maybe the mild, versus what the ventricle is able to handle. And um, uh, this is what led us to uh, consider um, maybe to uh, to to, to uh, an earlier intervention, early TAVI in this patient with AS and concomitant heart failure. Because, you know, uh, the therapy in systolic failure is focused on reducing afterload. Uh, because the main culprit mechanism of heart failure is increased afterload, right? And then in aortic stenosis, you have a fixed afterload that you cannot reduce by pharmacotherapy. So it makes sense to have a mechanical intervention to remove this afterload that may contribute to the heart failure. And this is, um, I mean, this hypothesis is further supported by this recent study uh, that was led by my uh, colleague and friend, Mariani Clavel, and they did that. This was a multi-center study. Uh, where they look at uh, the, um, in the patient with low EF, low flow, low gradient, so actually patient with systolic heart failure again, um, uh, patient with pseudo severe AS, who in fact moderate, according to calcium score, and who actually underwent TAVR still, uh, because they were considered to have severe AS based on other parameters, and they compare with those who were left on medical therapy. And you see clearly that the patients, and there were propensity score match again, um, uh, and you see that the patients who underwent an earlier uh, war, who underwent TAVR, although they were still moderate AS, uh, actually had much better outcome than those who were treated medically. So I think, um, I mean, this provides support to this trial that we, we designed uh, with several uh, good friends, including uh, Nicolas van Mingen, Martin Leon, Samuel Maria, et cetera. It's a, it's a tavern and not trial. So it, it's a, uh, it's, it was meant to be initially a 300 patient trial, but then we had the COVID and uh, the recruitment was slow. So we finished around 180 patients um, and we should report the results uh, probably at TCT next year. So it's really patients such as the patient I showed you. Moderate AS, systolic heart failure, and um, uh, eventually confirmed by Dobutavin Straseco. Uh, and, and they are randomized to TAVR now, transfemoral TAVR, versus optimized heart failure therapy. And the primary endpoint is a hierarchical endpoint of all-cause death, disabling stroke, 
uh, hospital hospitalization and change in quality of life for KCCQ. So um, stay tuned. I think it's going to be an interesting trial. And now there is more on moderate ES with the PROGRESS trial. The PROGRESS trial is a more uh, is a broader inclusion criteria. These are actually patients with moderate ES with symptoms or cardiac damage dysfunction using the criteria I mentioned before. So, and it's a up to 750 patients trial randomized to transfemoral TAVR again versus clinical surveillance. So similar design as early TAVR, but instead of being for asymptomatic severe AS, this is for at-risk moderate AS. And, um, and actually uh, breaking news, we just uh, closed the recruitment uh, earlier this week. So uh, this trial is is done, I mean, in terms of recruitment. Of course, the primary endpoint is uh, death, stroke, or unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization at two years. So we still have to wait for two more years to get the results. Um, but in this trial, the key inclusion criteria, we need to have confirmation of a moderate AS. And sometimes we use dobutamine stress echo. Sometimes you use calcium scoring to confirm the moderate AS. And then they need to have at least one risk factor. So symptoms or uh, cardiac damage, and you will recognize again some of the criteria I mentioned before, LDF less than 60%, diastolic dysfunction grade two or more, low flow state, uh, AFib, markedly elevated BNP, and et cetera. So this is a map of um, uh, you know the different trials that we have at the present time according to the grade, grading of uh, AS severity on the left, mild, moderate, severe, and the staging of extra valvular cardiac damage at the top. Um, and of course, for patients who have severe AS with symptoms, um, LV dysfunction, well, there are already class one indication for intervention. For those with asymptomatic severe AS, uh, well, and, and evidence of cardiac damage or not, um, there are several trials, early TAVR, Evolved uh, and uh, Avatar, EZES, so many, many kids on the blocks. Uh, and then for those with moderate AS with evidence of cardiac damage or symptoms, we have Tavern Load, as I mentioned, Progress. There is another one, Expand Taver 2, that is ongoing with the self expanding valve, whereas Progress is conducted with a balloon expandable valve. So, um, in conclusion, for this moderate AS, well, generally well tolerated by, by most patients who have a good ventricle and no cardiac damage. But in those patients who have evidence of cardiac damage or heart failure, especially systolic heart failure, this is probably poorly tolerated. So don't, don't take me wrong. Uh, so far, no indication for AVR in these patients with moderate AS, even if they have systolic heart failure. Uh, uh, and, and so we have to wait for the trials. But I think at least in these patients with moderate AS, especially if they are at risk, <coughs> what, what we should do is a closer clinical and echo follow-up. And um, probably every year, because if you look in the guideline, they would say, ah, oh, every two years, it's fine. But if you have some risk marker, I think every year, or maybe even more frequent is, is, is the way to go. And now, uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, mention that, um, okay, we, we, we see potential trials uh, that are ongoing that would eventually increase or expand the indication of TAVR to other population, low risk population. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about that. But on the other end, I feel a bit bad because um, I, I realize, and this is a study that has been conducted by, by Sami and Maria when he was at the, at the MGH, um, about the temporal trends in AVR utilization. And you, you realize um, uh, this, this, the, the, the red line is the indication uh, for AVR that is estimated, and the bars are actually the, the AVR that are actually performed. And you see there is a big gap. Uh, in your Euro Heart survey, we were estimating that about 30%, one third of the patients who actually have a strong indication for valve replacement finally never got the AVR because they are considered too old, too sick, or whatever reason. And you would think that after the introduction of TAVR, this gap will, will, will fill up. Um, well, according to this study, um, not at all. Actually, you still have a gap between the indication of intervention versus the in intervention that are actually performed. So 
before expanding you know to uh, other population maybe we have to consider to fill this gap first and this is this problem is even you know uh, more important in women uh, we know that for several reasons women are often more under detected under diagnosed uh, under referred and under treated so uh, this this problem of under treatment is probably more important in women as well as in um, in the minorities, racial, ethnic, and minorities, low socioeconomic status, the rural areas are not as well uh, deserved and and, um, and and don't have the same access to new technology than other indigenous population, etc. Uh, so, I think this is important to consider. Yes, we we want to expand AVR indication to other population, low risk population, asymptomatic, severe. But I think before doing this move, I think we should also put a priority on treating all the underserved population who already have established and well-validated validated indication for intervention. So the last new frontier I would like to discuss with you rapidly, this is more a bit more futuristic, but it's coming, uh, pharmacotherapy for autistic stenosis. Um, um, and again, I will illustrate this frontier with a case. This was one uh, patient who was included in one of our research projects, actually, uh, Progressa project uh, on which Lionel Pasté worked a lot. He was the coordinator for the study. And I think this is one of the patients he has seen, but a uh, 57-year-old man with calcific AS, tricuspid. Um, and uh, we recruit him at a mild stage because this is the inclusion criteria for this uh, study. And um, we do a calcium score as part of the research protocol, 750 uh, Agatston unit. Uh, and... Um, and, and actually, 2.5 years later, this patient is, is too severe, yes, with a pitch jet velocity of 4.4. The, um, the calcium score is now more than 2,000. This is one of the fastest uh, ES progression I've ever seen. And, and you may say, well, probably this patient may have some risk factor, but no bicuspid valve, no diabetes, no hypertension, no hypercholesterolemia. The only factor that we have seen is a high, very high LPA. Uh, lipoprotein small a. And of course, this brings me to this paper, uh, Mandelian randomization, um, that uh, for the first time uh, put the spotlight on the uh, LPA gene and some polymorphism of this uh, gene and association with the presence of uh, aortic valve uh, calcification. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and then uh, this this uh, study published in New England Journal of Medicine by the CHARGE Consortium was um, an association of uh, a genetic association of between the LPA and the presence of the disease. And then subsequently, in the context of the Astronomer trial, that was one of the negative trial testing uh, statin in, in, in AS, we found an association now between LPA, uh, elevated LPA, and the progression of the disease uh, and the occurrence of uh, adverse events, so essentially valve replacement or death, especially in the younger people. Uh, so um, yes, indeed, LPA is is a LPA is carrying a lot of uh, oxidized phospholipid um, that may um, be converted in into lysophosphatidic acid by different enzyme and the two enzymes that are key are LPPLA2 and autotaxin. And the uh, lysophosphatidic acid is, is a bad guy. Uh, I mean, this is a, a pro-inflammatory uh, agent and also uh, predisposing to fibrosis and, and mineralization. So we may have a causal, um, a causal factor here that is LPA. So this opened the, 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 the way of course for, for pharmacotherapy in AS. But what we don't know is and don't know yet which drug will work for us. We don't know that, not yet. There, there are some trials that are potentially uh, ongoing and starting, but no, we, do, we don't have the answer. What we know, however, is that one drug fits all will not work. Uh, why? Because there are several potential mechanisms and factors that may lead to AS. And yes, uh, AS has some similarities and, and common ground with atherosclerosis, lipid, infiltration, oxidation, endothelial dysfunction, and lipid-mediated inflammation. And so it makes sense to target the lipids. Uh, and we know that the statin fail, uh, so LDL um, may not have been a right target or 
not at the right time. Uh, but there are some trials that are ongoing with LPA, or that will start soon with LPA lowering, as I will show. PCSK9 inhibition is discussed. Uh, Atasiguat that is targeting the guanalitsi class uh, also is a trial that is ongoing. DPP4 inhibition is ongoing. This is the AVOID uh, trial. Uh, but AS is not only atherosclerosis. This is also activation of renin angiotensin system and hypertension-like disease. So it might be also a good idea to target, you know, uh, the renin angiotensin system with ACE inhibitors or ARPS. And Marianne Clavel in our group is conducting a pilot trial with ARPS in AS. And also this is an osteoblastic disease with some link with osteoporosis and dysregulation of phosphocalcic metabolism related to aging, et cetera. And uh, unfortunately, so far, the medication targeting the osteoporosis have failed. Bisphosphonate, rank of the bodies, uh, vitamin K, um, everything failed. So, uh, well, we have several targets, promising targets, but stay tuned. We have a challenge, however, for pharmacotherapy trials in AS because we know that we probably need to target patients at the mild or moderate stage maximum uh, because artic sclerosis is too soon. The number needed to treat would be huge. Artic, severe artic stenosis is too late because the patient are already on the path to intervention. So the sweet spot is probably mild, moderate AS. But if we target mild, moderate AS, before getting an event and a sufficient number of events, you will need a large sample size and very long follow-up. So using clinical events does not appear to be very realistic, you know, and an affordable trial. So I think we should probably more use imaging endpoint. And this is what we are, trying to discuss with FDA, um, and they are now ready to accept the idea of having, you know, um, probably an accelerated um, pathway for AS uh, using imaging endpoint as a primary. And the, the, probably the best endpoint would be the change in, in VMAX or Valvaria from baseline to three years and or change in the valve calcium score by CT again from baseline to three years. And this is what we are we're going to use for the LPA um, Frontiers uh, CAVS trial that is sponsored by Novartis using Pelacarsen. So Pelacarsen is an um, uh, oligonucleotide antisense directed to APOA um, and that um, markedly reduced the uh, LPA. So this is one injection a month and uh, they will be randomized to uh, 500 patients uh, mind to moderate AS, randomized to pelacarsen versus placebo. Uh, they need to have an elevated LPA. Uh, that The cut point was uh, 125 uh, initially, but they are changing that for 175. And they have an interesting endpoint. It's not a co-primary. It's actually two primary endpoints. Uh, and if one is significant, the trial will be positive. So um, one is the progression of the hemodynamic severity by echo, so change in, uh, in VMAX uh, measured by echo. The other primary endpoint is change in aortic valve calcium score by CT. Uh, and and the, this is from baseline to three years. Uh, one year is definitely too short. Two years is risky. Um, so three years is what is requested so far by FDA. Uh, and so, um, well, uh, this trial will start in March. Um, the other thing important to keep in mind, I already mentioned, but women have a different form of the disease. They have less calcification, but more fibrosis. So this brings us to the point again, that a drug that may work well in men, for example, because it targets calcification and mineralization uh, may not work as well in women and vice versa, a, work, a, a, a drug that targets more fibrosis that is antifibrotic, let's say, may work better in women than in men. So, so far, not yet any, any drug to, uh, to, to suggest to, to, to slow the progression of AS, but we are, there are some promising targets, you know, in the pipeline. It's a very exciting time. So we have LPA, PCSK9, renin angiotensin system, guanalysi class, DPP4, um, and several trials are either ongoing or we start soon or we start, you know, in, in 2024. Uh, the one drug fits all will not work. We'll probably need, you know, several drugs to address the different uh, subset of patients. And we'll need to tailor the therapy probably according to age, sex, baseline AS severity, and also the 
I would say the phenol group of AS because again, there are different uh, pathophysiology or pathogenesis that may lead to, to AS and, and the, the, the causal factors and mechanism may be different from one patient to the other. And so we may need different drugs to address this patient. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pivero. We'll just get straight to questions and I'll, I'll get to Dr. Amalia. I'll Maria first. Uh, Phil, really fantastic talk and very nice overview of the emerging fields in this space or emerging areas. Um, I wanted to ask you one question. You know, your group has really established the not only the existence, but the prognostic importance of paradoxical low flow, low gradient AS. And of course, now there's guideline recommendations. We treat these patients. We know how to manage them. Um, what do we do about the low, the normal flow, low gradient patients? You alluded to them briefly in the talk, but what, is, what do you think is the appropriate strategy for man managing those patients? So again, preserved ejection fraction, low valvaria, less than one, low gradient, um, but normal flow. So yeah, very good point, Sam. It's a it's a challenging group of patients, and that is actually quite prevalent. You know, it's even more frequent than paradoxical low flow and 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 classical low flow. So it's an important subset. And so the European guidelines they uh, state that. Uh, CVRS is unlikely in this patient. Uh, I, I somewhat disagree. I think it, it is less likely maybe, but still we, we found that about uh, 30 to 40% of these patients who have this normal flow low gradient uh, phenotype uh, actually have CVRS and they, they may benefit from earlier intervention. And there have been some meta-analysis showing that these patients with normal flow low gradient, they actually benefit from earlier intervention as much as the paradoxical low flow low gradient. So the American guidelines are more silent on this, <laughs> on this subgroup. <coughs> Excuse me. My my my, my uh, suggestion would be um, uh, would be to use the same strategy as paradoxical low flow low gradient. If you are sure of your measurement, first thing, double check the measurements, you know, and make sure you know you did not underestimate the stroke volume and variar or the gradient and that actually the discrepancy that you have is not real, but it's just due to the measurements. So that's the first step. And then if the patient is symptomatic, if the patient is asymptomatic, I don't think you have to struggle a lot. You know, you just follow the patient and that's it. But if the patient is symptomatic, you're pretty confident with your measurements, then I think you uh, the, the next step would be to do, do a calcium score. And if the calcium score is severe, well, I think um, this is, I think to me, enough argument to consider intervention. So exactly the same approach as paradoxical low flow low gradient. Great, thank you. Dr. Dillon? Yes, great talk. Um, very clear uh, points. I, I just had a question about mixed bowel disease and uh, um, you know the role of moderate aortic regurgitation in determining outcomes for moderate aortic stenosis. And what is your view about that? Yeah, good question, uh, Francesca. Difficult, difficult question. <laughs> um, this is another uh, area where we have some uh, gap, uh, some knowledge gap, and and met needs. You know, in the guidelines, uh, I think multiple disease and mixed disease. This is about three paragraph uh, because we have no data, and I think uh, uh, to me and 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 we we did some position statement on on this topic and uh, the mixed disease. I think, you know, a, uh, to me, a, a, a moderate AS with a moderate AR is equivalent to a, a um, altogether, the, you know, the summation of the, these two moderate disease makes a severe overall artificial disease and probably an indication for intervention. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, and, uh, um, and there are some, some suggestions that maybe in these patients with mixed disease, the mean gradient is probably a good overall marker of the severity of the uh, of the mixed disease because the gradient would increase with both the stenosis and the AR because of the flu that is increased with the AR. So, um, but I think we have no good tools, right? Uh, to uh, the calcium score um, would merit to be uh, tested in this patient also. Um, 
uh, and has not yet been done uh, from what I know. Uh, that's a difficult subset of patients. And the problem is that we are we don't have enough data, we don't have enough evidence. The main reason is because most of the trial or even the registry, uh, we are either focusing on the ES or on the AR, and the patients who have mixed disease, they are excluded from uh, both types of trials, right? Uh, you, you're excluding patients who have more than moderate ES, or they are excluded from the TAVA versus SAVA trial, et cetera. And same with multiple valve disease, you know, as soon as you have significant concomitant MR, patients are excluded. So finally, we don't have the data for these patients. Thank you. All right, perhaps one, one more from Dr. Amalria. Yeah, just I don't want to hog your time. I don't know if others have questions, but I, I wanted to quickly ask about the calcium score. You know, I think um, there's a very nice uh, thresholds that are provided in men and women. And part of that is based on what you've nicely outlined in regards to the different mechanism of aortic stenosis with greater calcification in men. I do suspect, however, there's got to be some relationship to size as well. Um, and even if you just limit it to men, you know, a calcium score of, let's say, 2000 is very different than somebody who has an annular area of 300 square, center, square millimeters versus somebody who has an annular area closer to 600. Uh, square millimeters. And so I wonder, is there any thought about indexing the cat valve calcium scores to the annular area? And would that give a better sense of the density of calcium <clears throat> and perhaps correlate better with the severity of AS? So oh, absolutely, uh, Sammy. And I think, uh, uh, and Maria Nick has, uh, and, uh, and together also we have examined this. Um, and um, you're absolutely right, you know, uh, and and I, I have a confidence to 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 tell. But we, when we initially found that there was a big difference between men and women in the absolute score, you know, to predict uh, events and to differentiate severe versus non-severe, we say, oh, of course, we men have a smaller annulus, so this is the reason why, you know, you need less calcification in a in a, in a small annulus to 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 reach hemodynamically severe, yes, and so. We calculated the, what we call the calcium density, which is a calcium score divided by the aortic annulus area. And we doubt, naively, <laughs> that this will reconcile the discrepancy and it will be able to, to use the same, the same uh, cut point. But actually, no. Um, uh, we still have, um, I think, we, 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 the cut point, the optimal cut point when you use calcium density is 500 unit per. Um, Per centimeter square of of annulus for for men versus three hundred in women, so still a big difference. And I think the reason is because again, women have a have an aortic stenosis that's more maybe driven by fibrosis and men by, by calcification. Um, and and so we may need to use modality that measure both calcification and and fibrosis. Um, but I think still, you know, uh, we we uh, Maria Nick showed that if you use the calcium density rather than the absolute score prediction of outcome uh, is is not markedly better, but it is significantly better, uh, which makes sense. And where it may make a difference, especially in when you compare men versus women, but also when you compare bicuspid versus tricuspid. And this is where we, we really found an advantage of eventually using the calcium density because um, we know that bicuspid valve generally have larger, much sometimes much larger analysts than a patient with tricuspid. And so uh, you may have in, in, in bicuspid valve some calcium scores that are very impressive, but not necessarily an hemodynamically severe AS because this is an enlarged analysis. So uh, definitely, I think, and this will probably come in the guidelines. Um, uh, we, we, we are systematically in, in our institution calculating both the absolute calcium score and the calcium density, uh, especially when you have, you know, uh, small or on the other end, large analysts. I think this is where I think you you may uh, you may have some incremental information. Thank you. That's helpful. All right. Well, no surprise. We are we're over time with a great and lively discussion. Um, thank you, Dr. Piberell. I want to be sensitive to to your time and um, thanks for joining and, and staying with us. Fifteen extra minutes. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure.
Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.